evening, everyone. Um, I'm Sonia Colina, I'm a professor of Spanish and Portuguese, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the, right here at the University of Arizona. And uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction about how we are going to organize this. But of course, first of all, thank you all for you being, for all of you being here. And this is, I mean, this is a great turnout, which just makes us really happy. Um, again, um, thank you. Uh, remember, we'll have uh, a reception afterwards, and so don't forget about that. And this is the way pretty much we're going to organize this. So we're going to have each one of the three panelists we have to, uh, today here, Claudia Angelelli, Edwin Gensler, and Anthony Pym. Each one of them is going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes at their discretion. And then we're going to have about 10 or 5 minutes, a total period of 30, 30 minutes, for questions that are specific to the talk. You know, things that have to do with something they've said, that maybe needs a little clarification, something they are specifically interested in. Okay. So then that will be an hour and a half. We'll be giving you a little bit of an introduction to each one of them and to their background. Uh, after each one of them has finished, then we're going to have about a half an hour panel, okay, so that anyone can ask any questions of any of the panelists. You know, they could be questions that um, you didn't have a chance to ask about their talk, or they could be questions just in general about multilingualism and translation, <coughs> which is in general is the topic of, of this mini symposium and the topic of each one of their presentations in general. Each one of them will present in an area, and within that general area, some aspects that have to do with what they do with their specific area of expertise in translation studies. Okay. Um, David? Alrighty. Thank you very much, Sonia, um, and also for spearheading and masterminding this whole wonderful gathering today. Uh, my name is David Gramling from the Department of German Studies. And I have the happy task of thanking everyone who contributed to this event. Um, and it's so lovely to have a crowd like this um, for this particular kind of conversation. So let me just share with you very quickly all my gratitude towards, uh, towards uh, those of you who were uh, contributors to the event, primarily the Department of Spanish and Portuguese who has a pride of place for this event as having one of the only uh, BA programs in translation and interpretation in the country, so uh, that should be noted. Um, also, the College of Humanities, uh, the National Center for Interpretation, uh, the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry, who is hosting our reception directly afterwards. Um, I think there's some, you all want to come in? There's some seats over there. Um, and also, we had strong financial support from my own host uh, department, the Department of German Studies, uh, the Center for Inter uh, Educational Resources in Culture, Language, and Literacy, CIRCLE, uh, the Critical Multilingual Multilingualism Studies Journal, of uh, which we have several board members of that journal here in the room as well, um, including one of our speakers, Anthony Pym, uh, the Department of uh, East Asian Studies, uh, the Department of English, the Graduate Interdisciplinary Program in uh, Second Language Acquisition and Teaching, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Center for English as a Second Language, uh, the School of Middle Eastern, Stud Mid Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the School of International Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. Um, and I'd like to warmly thank the directors and the uh, heads and the deans of those various units on campus for investing in this particular event. I would also like to, of course, thank the Poetry Center for this fantastic room uh, and their hospitality, particularly An Annie um, uh, Leach, uh, Ali, I'm sorry, Ali Leach, uh, Sibel Knowles, and Director Gail Brown. Um, I'd also like to mention that beyond the actual co-sponsors for this event, there's lots of constituencies in the room. Um, and I'd like to mention some of those uh, who are here among this particular gathering. That includes faculty and graduate students in Russian and Slavic studies, classics, linguistics, uh, speech and hearing, uh, film, gender and women's studies, French and Italian, Africana studies. Uh, we have scholars from the Sc School of Education here in language, uh, reading, and culture. We have physicians. We have uh, health uh, interpreters and translators. We have court translators. We have uh, uh, local uh, public policy folks. We have 
language learners at every level and language teachers at every level. We have, um, we have literary translators from at least 10 different languages in the room. Um, and we have uh, working uh, literary translators and, and translators in other fields. We have those who are currently training to become translators and er interpreters. Um, and to, I just wanted to mention that so that we have a sense as to what kind of gathering this is. So that when uh, our new university president, and we've heard talked last Friday at her inaugural address about integration and application, I think this is exactly the kind of gathering that she had in mind. So uh, that's very exciting to me. Uh, a couple of logistical items that I'd like to mention, and then I'm going to sit down and listen, I promise. Uh, we have a clipboard uh, that uh, uh, Jenna and Melissa over here are going to share with us. If your name is not on that clipboard, please do sign up so that we can tell you more about initiatives like this coming in the future. U of A is notoriously federal it's in some ways. It's difficult to find people and, and uh, share information, share uh, accomplishments and plans and, uh, and initiatives. So if we can use this opportunity to kind of create a community around multilingualism and translation, I think that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, so to that end, please do enter some information about yourselves on that clipboard. Today's event is going to be videoed, uh, so it will be available for you to share with folks that were not able to be here. Uh, we'll hopefully have it up uh, by the first of the year, and it's going to be on a website called Centering Translation at arizona.edu. Uh, so we'll have that together for you to share uh, by the time you're nice and rested up and ready for the new semester. Um, I also want to uh, thank our Dean of the College of Humanities, Mary Wilton Bassett, for being an extraordinary inspiration and, uh, and support for this type of initiative, and without her, uh, this would not be taking place. So uh, I'd like to um, ask you to give a warm wel welcome to our Dean, uh, Mary Wilton Bassett. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. This is great. As you've heard, my name is Mary Wilner Bassett. I have the privilege to serve as Dean of the College of Humanities and the real privilege of welcoming you all to this event and especially our visiting scholars. Thank you so much for being here. We're here to together to take advantage of the opportunity presented by having these scholars here on campus and of all of your interest, as we can see now, to reach out to translation studies and translation scholars on campus, regionally, nationally, and internationally. I'd like to encourage us all to view the current moment as an auspicious one for encouraging transdisciplinary initiatives on professional translation, translation studies, interpreting, critical multilingualism studies, and related fields. There's a lot of relations going on here. I'd also like to call for all of you, our faculty, graduate students, and all of you are interested here to self-identify and join the effort, just as David in, just invited you, sharing the ways in which our work interacts with the kinds of translingual and transcultural inquiries that we are emphasizing with this event. Translingual and transcultural inquiries have long been at the heart of how the College of Humanities contributes to civil discourse, to the knowledge economy, and to our land-grant university mission in a border region rich with many cultures and many languages. In spite of that, it is so far a unique event today that translation studies scholars can be brought together in this way for this many people to exchange stories about their shared institutional, social, theoretical, applied, and cultural experiences. We can't ignore the undercurrent that is often unspoken in translation and related studies that the social marginalization of translation, and especially often interpreting, has social, ethical, economic, and legal consequences, often masked by or masking social prejudice. In contrast to that way of thinking, though, I want to emphasize here that our cultural and linguistic diversity is one of the most important social assets of our region and of the U University of Arizona. Multilingual information access and multimedia forms of translingual and transcultural communication are our strategic priority. Localization of multilingual services has become a major industry branch and a professional service sector with growing market shares. Many of you know this, maybe even intend to work in that. 
a critical understanding of and support of communication across languages and cultures in most domains of science and technology, economy, art and culture of all kinds, social interactions, and healthcare, to name just a few, all of these require theorizing and applied understandings of all that is involved in translingual and transcultural communication. The National Center for Interpretation, Testing, Research, and Policy, known here as NCI, here at the University of Arizona, is dedicated to ensuring language access to limited English persons. The center has gained international recognition and it offers a variety of services, including interpreter training and testing in both the legal and the medical fields, and self-study materials to ensure that interpreters especially reach a level of excellence required by the field. The work of the National Center is poised now to expand and to include additional initiatives that will further enhance translingual and transcultural opportunities that can be a focal point for much of what we do here at the U of A in this realm along with what we've already heard about, the translation and interpretation emphasis with the BA in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and some of the many other initiatives that we have. We want to see more involvement from many languages and cultures, and we want to grow and deepen our expertise, our understanding. We want to integrate and apply, just as our president and as David has reminded us. I welcome you all now to hear from our speakers and to join with us as we embark on centering translation, interpretation, and multilingualism. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay, it's my turn then to introduce the first speaker. I'm just going to give you a few words about so that you have a bit of an idea about her background. Uh, Dr. Claudia Angelelli, she is a professor of Spanish and Portuguese linguistics at uh, San Diego State University, and she teaches a variety of courses there, such as research methods, applied linguistics, and also, of course, Spanish, English Spanish translation and interpretation. Um, her PhD is in educational linguistics from Stanford, and also she has a number of other uh, translation and language related degrees, such as a Master of Arts in Teaching Foreign Languages in Spanish. She has graduate certificates in TESOL and also in language pro uh, program administration from the Monterey Institute of International Studies. And she also has a degree in comparative law and legal translation from Argentina. And have various other certificates in English, Spanish, French translation, and interpreting also from Argentina. Um, publications, she has published quite a bit. She's very well known in translation and interpreting studies, but I'll just give you a few titles here so that you may have seen other, yeah but you may recognize in the future if you see him now. She's the author of Medical Interpreter and Cross-Cultural Communication, published by Cambridge University Press, Revisiting the Role of the Interpreter, another book published by John Benjamins, and she's the co-editor of Testing and Assessment in Translation and Interpreting Studies, also published by John Benjamins. She's published a number of articles regularly in Interpreting, Meta, Monty, The Translator, The Annual Review of Applied Linguistics, The Critical Link, TIS, uh, translation and Interpretive Studies, the International Journal of the Sociology of Language. She has also done enough of applied work, applied research work with foundations and a number of other groups. Among them, she designed the first empirical driven language proficiency and interpreter readiness test for the California endowment, endowment and also for Hablamos Juntos. She is the president of ATISA, American Translation and Interpreting Scholars Association. She is the world project leader for the ISO standards community, international standards organization, on community interpreting, and she is a director of the Consortium of Distinguished Language Centers. She is also serving, she has served as um, ATA, sorry, she has served, she's not currently serving, but she has served as ATA, one of the ATA directors, American Translation Association, for six years. Okay, and without any further delay, Dr. Angelari, please. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you for this invitation. It's really my pleasure to share my research with you today. Um, can you hear me okay if I speak with this microphone? Okay. There we go. So in the next 20 minutes, I will try and give you a, an overview of uh, the topic that brings us together today and I will 
try and address linguistic diversity in the US, basically we don't need to argue that point, but just showing numbers, and how do we as a nation meet these linguistic needs? What are our responses at the national and state level? I'll be giving the example of California. I have some little data on Arizona, but you know more than me about Arizona. And then um, we are going to look at the key players in translation and interpreting and the value of experiential and scientific knowledge in the field. I'm going to address the role of research and academia in translation and interpreting and the role of specifically translation and interpreting studies. So multilingualism in the United States is nothing new. Here is the data from the 2010 census. And as we can see, 20% um, of the population in the United States does not speak English. But the picture gets even more interesting when we look at what does it mean uh, and how people speak English. This graph is showing us that um, out of the number of people who do not speak English well, these people generally are known to no need some language assistant at a certain point, whether when they go to a hospital at the court, enrolling for school, whatever it might be, they may need some assistant in language. So the picture gets even more interesting when we look at the percentage of speakers of other languages than English, and now we compare the nation, the state of Arizona and California, and we are seeing here the increase between the census of 2000 and 2010. So just to set a background for uh, the talk. Uh, I'm specifically interested in the healthcare sector. Lately I've been conducting research with Spanish, Hmong, and Cantonese in uh, different uh, hospitals and clinics. And a national survey that I'm using from 2006 is indicating that 80% of the hospital that took part in this survey encounter patients with limited English. And at that point, this is how the hospitals that took part in this survey responded to this need. We can see that 92% of the hospitals were offering, are offering now interpreting via telephone services. Sometimes they have those telephonic interpreters on site and sometimes they contract outside agencies. 18% have community interpreters, 74% are supplying that need with what we call ad hoc interpreters, with non-professional interpreters. 82% have bilingual clinical staff, for example, the x-ray technician, that they may call them to say, you know, I need an interpreter here and I don't have an interpreter, could you do this for me? Sometimes the bilingual employee is listed on a register as offering this uh, bilingual service and sometimes it's just because they have a last name that is Gutierrez and they would just pull Gutierrez and ask Gutierrez to interpret, right? 66% uh, are using external services, 63 independent, and 68% are the hospitals that have staff interpreters, interpreters on board. How do we as a nation respond to this need? How do we tackle this problem? We have national associations. I'm speaking here uh, mostly in terms of how do we respond to the practice. So for example, um, the American Translators Association has a big division of interpreters where they discuss <laughs> issues of uh, interpreters' practical needs. We have the National Association for Judiciary Interpreters, the National Council for Interpreting in Healthcare, and the, what used to be the, Nash, the Massachusetts Medical Interpreters Association now is International Mas uh, Medical uh, Interpreters Association. So these are associations that are offering workshops, courses, they have a code of ethics, they, um, they bring together professionals with a conference maybe one per year, maybe regional conferences more times a year. Let's take a look at how some of these associations are certifying interpreters. And I think things get really interesting, at least for me, when we go deeper into understanding uh, the different requirements. Here we see that in order to be certified as a medical interpreter, where we know so far in the United States we do not have a master's. We used to have one in applied linguistics and health services. We no longer have it. And uh, we don't have a VA that prepares students specifically for medical interpreting. But a high school degree would do. And we have to be proficient in English and the target language. There is a written and an oral exam. Um, the interpreters need to give, re get recertified every five years. And the interesting part is that that can be done with completing 30 hours of continuing education. So sometimes attending a conference would allow you to get recertified. Uh, similar situation with the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters where 
we need at least 40 hours of training, and there's, uh, there are popular programs that are 40 hours of training that are based on ethics. So a bilingual person gets on the training and can get certified and know the ethics, but may never have done simultaneous or consecutive interpreting. So, so it's interesting to look at how these things are constructed and to analyze them and to see what abilities they are targeting, what skills are being measured, and how they are being measured. And I could go on and on, but I want to save time for questions. So I jump ahead, and I talk specifically about California. Uh, California passed legislation whereby each hospital that receives federal funding needs to offer interpreting services. And what happens in California? How can an interpreter become educated as an interpreter certified? Again, we have some developed in legal interpreting, but not a whole lot in medical interpreting. So when it comes to education, we have requirements as the ones you're seeing on the screen for judicial interpreters. When it comes to medical interpreters, as I said, we don't have programs. Here are some professional associations offering workshops and short, uh, what they call training. And I, I have to say I have a problem with the word training. I talk about professional development. I don't want training to get confused <coughs> with education. So this is the different associations that we have. And yes, we do have a code of ethics in California. Um, so, if I may now pause for a minute and say, what is this picture telling us? Here's where I, uh, I think we, we pause and we reflect. There's the practice of translation and interpreting, which is so imperative and so important, because otherwise, how do linguistic minorities get access to services, right, if we don't have a body of practitioners that are doing their job? Now, the issue becomes a little more complicated when we see that the practitioners hold a body of knowledge that's based mostly on their experience, beliefs, and training. And I'm using the word training because it's this 40 hours or eight hours or two hours. Then sometimes uh, those same practitioners are running the professional associations. So we see that by running the professional associations and taking part in there, many times the rules of practice, the standards of practice, the code of ethics are in a way um, authored by these practitioners who are running the profession and who may know um, how to do their job and may or may not have had enough time and enough uh, education to reflect on ethics and maybe ruling on a code of ethics out of wider knowledge or out <coughs> of uh, experiential knowledge. And then, in some cases in the United States, we have the schools that are more practice-oriented also run by practitioners, which means that in many cases, classes are taught out of practice. So they are practice-oriented, most of the instructors belong to professional associations, are teaching based on their practical and experiential knowledge, and this is how the discourse on translation and interpreting becomes constructed. And so it's interesting to see that outside of that circle of practice, there are also people who are studying translation and interpreting, or also practicing translation and interpreting, but if we don't interact, if we have one circle and then we have theories, research, knowledge from related fields, and I would argue crucial fields to translation and interpreting studies, such as cross-cultural communication, bilingualism, uh, cultural studies, linguistics, anthropology, sociolinguistics, just to name a few, um, then we can see how we may be operating to different words. And it's never a good thing to have um, practice and, and research or academia not going together. So this may justify, for example, why we may require only 32 hours of education for a medical interpreter to walk into an assignment, or how we, we may not even require any education from a medical interpreter to walk into an assignment. And I'm not saying here it cannot be done. That's not my message. My message is, Let's pause and look. What does that mean in terms of access to services? What does that mean if I get <coughs> communication negotiated by my cousin, you know, who's an ad hoc interpreter? And if I don't have a professional interpreter, my cousin will go to visit with me and will interpret for me. Um, so I want to now bridge towards the notion of I think we all in this room, I'm amazed because we have not only multilingualism, but multi interdisciplinarity in the making here and when, when you define who uh, was attending this colloquium. So I think this goes without explaining that we see how uh, different theories, different fields of knowledge uh, nurture 
theories in translation and interpreting. It goes without saying. And sometimes, when we look at those 30-hour workshops, we may be depriving the uh, participants from <coughs> understanding and considering translation and interpretation in its widest possible way, which is ethical dilemmas that will be, you know, will occur. And how do I uh, explain to my students that this will happen if I take this path, and this will happen if I take this other one, and I need to be aware. And every, every decision comes with responsibility. And if I have not been given a chance to reflect on that, that could be a problem. So translation and interpreting theory and research have not been divorced from practice. And I have here only some examples that are all listed in the handout that if we don't have enough, it's going to be on the website. And I tried, I guessed here, not to overlap with my colleagues. So I, I only listed some studies in what I think are not going to be uh, fields that will be discussed by you. But for example, we see bridges in uh, the acquisition and development of translation and interpreting skills when we look at studies on bilingual children and bilingual youngsters. How do those bilingual youngsters, for example, broker interactions with their families? When we look at how we teach languages, we first look also at how language is acquired as a first language, and we learn a lot from the acquisition of first language when we teach second language. Same thing occurs when we look at how youngsters, children, bargain, broker language between the community and their families. And we have seen plenty of studies coming out of Canada and the United States and Europe in that area. We also see studies comparing bilinguals and professionals and looking at um, you know, what are the skills that, that we may think come natural with being bilingual and then what are the ones that really need to be taught. No bilingual learned how to do sight translation without being taught how to do sight translation, for example, so on and so forth. We see studies on curriculum design where we also bridge uh, education and translation and interpreting studies, measurement and testing. Um, designing tests for the classroom for the purposes of certifying interpreters or translators and in industry in general for a job position for example. We also see studies on role, on problematizing that role that's taken for granted when we think that interpreters are invisible, transparent, neutral or that they are you know, social workers. There are problems in both sides and, and so we reflect on those and research helps us understand and, and pinpoint what the issues are. We also see research in professional ideology. Um, how does one become a professional translator and interpreter when we don't have the system that we have for medical doctors, right? So um, does, does being a member of an association make it, or passing an exam, or attending meetings, or what is this professional ideology, and who is professional and who is not? And ethical dilemmas is the one I mentioned. So just by way of an example in the next three minutes, I will go through um, an example of a mixed methods research design where I was curious to see the notion of visibility, of being present and taking part in an interaction. I wanted to know what interpreters' perceptions on their role was. And if I offer a continuum of one to six, one being really invisible, neutral, don't exist in the room, six being broker communication, take part, clarify and whatnot, where do they think they fall based on their perceptions on their role and their beliefs of their practice? And then, that being done in a qualitative way, the second part would be an ethnography, a qualitative study on the role that interpreters play during an interpretive communicative event. So, quickly going through this, uh, there's the interpret interpersonal research Interpreters interpersonal role inventory, sorry, that has 51 items that would ask interpreters agree or disagree, one to six, my role as an interpreter is not well done until understanding doesn't happen, for example. An interpreter who believes that's not my role, my role is there just to interpret, then if the parties are at ease or if they gain an understanding is a different story, we'll go absolutely disagree. An interpreter who believes that his role is only to broker and not to be neutral, will be absolutely agree. So I wanted to find out in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, in three different settings, conference, court, and medical, what are interpreters' perceptions about their role? Rather than taking them for granted and prescribing on what their role should be, I wanted to see if those prescriptions match practice. 
So I will skip through the results of who took part in this, what social factors were measured, socioeconomic status, education, and whatnot. But this is really where I want to stop for a minute and see that as a result of that study, what we see is social factors such as affect, age, ethnicity, gender, nationality, power, race, socioeconomic status, and solidarity do play a role. The interaction doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's permeated by the, all the restrictions of the institution and the cultural norms, societal blueprints in general belonging to a specific society. So nothing occurs in a vacuum, and we see that in discourse. How do we see it? I'll skip through all of this that tell us these differences are real and there's only a 1% chance that they happen, 1% that happen by chance. I'll skip this and go into how do we know this. Going into a hospital, I followed 10 interpreters and a manager during 22 months, and I pause here just to show you the background of the interpreters. These were staff interpreters in a hospital where I spent 22 months collecting data and trying to see what strategies they are using to become more visible. And you see on the fourth column to the right, their education. And we see again, it ranges from high school to being medical doctors in their own country. There were three of them out of the 10 that were medical doctors. All of these were employees of the hospital at the time, working eight hours. And then what did I see? All of this evidence of visibility through their behaviors that I think it will become better if I just give you an example going through this, um, this slide. Um, the more interpreters take part, the more consequential those interventions will be for the quality and the quantity of medical and personal information that got trespassed. So the more an interpreter intervenes, for example, uh, on a scale from 1 to 10, how would you rate your pain? And then we see the interpreter going, um, Señora Maria, if one is a number that you can go dancing, you're fine, and 10 is that you're almost dying, what number? Like, what, how would you rate your pain? Señora Maria would go, dying? I'm not dying. And all of a sudden, we see 16 turns of talk, interaction between the interpreter and the patient, trying to understand what this pain scale means. And then we see another set of eight turns trying to construct a pain rating that by the time it's done, may mean nothing to the healthcare provider, the patient, or the interpreter, or maybe exactly the rating that we needed. And I know, by the way, this happens to us in a monolingual setting, too, because every time you know, I get an anesthesia, I will be asked that question, and I purposely ask, what's the difference between a two and a three? And no, no hope in getting an answer. So this is showing how interpreters go from the use of pronouns, which is extremely innocuous, such as, you know, I'm interpreter so-and-so, I'm going to help you in talk with the doctor. So the interpreter gets into, introduces the self, if it hasn't been introduced, from that one that will have no consequences because we all do that as speakers, right? When we are meeting, we are at a cocktail party and we haven't been introduced, we stand there until we just introduce each other. No consequences to that, to the interpreter replacing the monolingual interlocutor. That medical doctor in this country of origin that's not taking off the hat of the doctor and putting the interpreter's one on, but all of a sudden, in the case of an emergency, gives more advice than what was given by the monolingual interlocutor. I have tons of data to illustrate that. I'm not making any of this up. I just <laughs> don't have time to show you transcripts, but they are in your list of publications. Now, this study that I conducted in California, I replicated in Australia, both the, quantit the quantitative and the qualitative ones. So we now have data on Australians' healthcare interpreters on their perceptions and beliefs about their role coming from Melbourne, Sydney, and Darwin. I'm extremely excited to be working with uh, three different groups of interpreters there, the immigrants, the refugees, and the indigenous languages interpreters. So, and not by chance, and I'm closing with this, the, the problems are very similar to the ones we have in the United States, we have in Arizona. Here's a background information for you, to 160 languages spoken, and this is a status quo. So the difficulty, of finding qualified interpreters. The fact that all of a sudden the interpretation services is going into hands of private sector, what's prevailing is the cost. So the lower the cost, the better, and we don't look at the quality of interpretation. And I won't read through all of this, just to illustrate it's, it's the same problem that we are having, although the population is different. And so by way of concluding this, what I wanted to say, which I don't think it's anything new, is that we know that Linguistic minorities need access to services, and as the need for translation and interpreters continues to grow, how do we provide, as a nation, 
a meaningful response to this need. And I think it's coming out of this dialogue, this conversation, as the one you're having here today, between research and practice. Because I believe that research and theory inform practice, and we want that practice to be informed, and practice, indeed, makes research and theory relevant. So with that, I would like to close my talk and open the floors to questions. about eight, ten, ten minutes for questions, maybe eight. Uh, I think we're just going to pause to uh, bring down the blinds okay. because it might be a little yeah. bit difficult. I wanted to have my sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's coming down, down though. I don't think it's going to um, So this microphone can go out into the audience for people to move. I actually have a question from a medical doctor standpoint. Uh, have you guys looked at, you looked at what interpreters think, right? But have you looked at what medical doctors prefer and what patients prefer? And I wonder what, what data you found out. Thank you, thank you for the question, because when I conducted that study, um, a question that was guiding me was a question about interpreters, per se, but I did have to interact with the two parties. And as a way of also giving back to the hospital where I spent all this time, during run rounds, I was presenting data to medical doctors, and I got many, many different reactions. Um, this was a hospital where interpreters were staff members, and interpreters were saying that they were always called by the same doctor who, um, with whom they could work as a team, that the doctor was very comfortable in working with him, etc. Then I would talk to the doctors, and the doctors knew that certain interpreters were better than others, then would do things that will help them in their work. For example, the patient was walking on, on the, um, in order to get an AKG on the treadmill. And so the doctor would look at the patient and say, you know, I don't really understand the gestures and I don't know what he's trying to say. So why don't you ask the questions about, are you feeling okay? Are you doing okay? So you could see that teamwork. Then when I was showing them discourse and I was trying to tell them, you know, you're giving up control of the medical interview when you do such things as, for example, ask her about chronic illnesses and all that, kind of taking the medical history. So the interpreter would take it upon himself to go, um, have you ever had surgery? Have you ever had this? And listed certain types of illnesses. And then would go, have you, had cert have you been hospitalized here or there? Have you taken any medicine? Any medicine over the counter? Any medicine prescribed? Anything given to you by La Comadre Juana, right? That, that would never have happened if it, or yes, we don't know. So I, I was really concerned about this notion of interpreters have not been trained as medical doctors. And yes, they have done that for a long, long time. Yes, in this particular case, three were medical doctors, but they were not appointed as medical doctors. They didn't have the board for, you know, to practice as medical doctors here. So the control of the medical interview sometimes belonged to the doctors, sometimes was, you know, co-chair, sometimes, you know, it was given to the interpreter and the interpreter would run with that. So I had different reactions. And I think uh, what I did get almost across the board was we have no time. We have, so when interpreters wanted to conduct a pre conference interview and explain their role to patients, say, you know, you need to be careful because everything you say has to be interpreted. I have the duty to do that. Sometimes the patient would say, don't tell the doctor, but I'm not taking this pill. So they were warning <laughs> the patient. Many times doctors would say, you know what, we have no, no time to do this. Because of course, an interview that would be interpreted would take a little longer, sometimes a lot longer, sometimes a little. Although we have had hospitals where I've conducted research measuring consecutive interpreting and mm -hmm. taking turns, whereas there's a case in Northern California where they use simultaneous interpreting. And now it's being used in New York and in video interpreting and whatnot. So that the time frame, the time issue would not be an excuse now because we can do it pretty much in the same amount of time. Another thing that I've heard doctors in medical conferences who pays for this, right? When it's not the federal mandate, but it's, it's a hospital that has to do it who covers the cost. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah, but what about patients, though? What do they? Okay, patients don't want to wait. 
So in my data, what I have is patients being really, really happy when an interpreter was available right there, and they didn't care if it was on the phone, on the speaker phone at the time in that hospital, his cousin or who, as long as the <laughs> interview, because sometimes it took them a long time to be able to get that appointment with the doctor. So patients were grateful to have an interpreter in the room, and patients couldn't tell the difference if the interpreter was able to do a good job or not. Thank you. Sure. I have another question. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question about uh, medical tourism. I know there's been a huge increase in medical tourism, especially in like Mexico and the U.S., even in San Diego. Do you believe there's going to be some sort of um, medical certification that's specific for medical tourism, um, some sort of international certification, I suppose? I, I started studying medical tourism in Korea, actually, because that was one of the places where um, they, they started doing research on medical tourism. And then... Um, I, I'm, I'm really bad at telling, forecasting the future because I, I don't want to say something that I cannot support, but um, it, it wouldn't be a surprise. The thing is that we first would need to have a solid program in place for medical interpreting that goes beyond 40 hours or one semester. And I know there are efforts across the nation and there are you know, wonderful opportunities online, but to go from an introduction to the field to then specialize, and go beyond terminology, which is the issue, in the sense that um, medical tourism brings another factor into the equation, which is not uh, how immigrants sometimes their access to language and to services perceived as he doesn't understand, he doesn't have the degree of education, we need to tailor it to his language. Medical tourism, you have, you don't have that. The social factors are completely different. I'm not saying you don't have it, but you have it to a lesser extent. So you get people who may have a medical degree and go to have certain surgery in a country where, you know, they have uh, better access to it or whatnot. So I think it calls for different strategies and they are also going into escorting and taking care of it and doing many things that uh, in the U.S. they're still in debate. Like some hospitals expect from interpreters to push the wheelchair and to take the patient to the uh, chapel and to go to a pharmacy and others would go no you know you just do your role and only that so it's 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 really really difficult to, to say because code of ethics many times uh, mean well and end up putting interpreters between a rock and a hard place in the sense that interpreters either want to hold on to their jobs and believing this ethical dilemma is also problematic. So I hope the day comes when we are tailoring to medical tourism too. I don't know. Thank you. We have one more question. Um, I've often seen the policy in certain <coughs> medical settings where, where there's a sign that says you have to bring your own interpreter, you must bring your own interpreter. And um, I find that those policies end up driving who is doing the interpreting. It's oftentimes family members because these families are not hiring someone to bring with them to go to the doctor's appointment. So I just wanted to ask you in all your travels, have you found a policy either in, in, a, in any kind of medical setting that you find actually drives the right, the correct kind of use of interpreters rather than kind of leading people <laughs> down the path of kind of pursuing unethical ways of interpreting? Well. I'm thinking of um, one particular hospital, a rural hospital in Darwin, um, where they had not only signs, but they had an office to welcome Aboriginal patients into the hospital and to do even an introduction on the different culture because the patients were coming in with beliefs, and I don't mean to be to stereotype at all here, it's just you know what I collected in interviews. Um, for example, they would not accept to go to a second floor and the operating rooms were not at the ground level and they wanted to be at ground level. Um, so they went through a lot of effort in trying to ease the patients and it, of course it would never be the culture of a hospital and the culture of the patients in this particular case even more are very different. But I thought that was very, very interesting and they would provide um, professional interpreters as far as they can be agencies but then when you look into the agencies and how the education or the training happens, it's problematic too, because it's basically knowing these key words. And so they, they end up speaking like Tarzan, but they may get the right organ or not, I don't know. So it's, it's a problem, but um, from what I've seen, 
in the US, when you get federal funding, you have to provide an interpreter. And even in those cases, sometimes those signs are not on, saying this is our duty to the patient. So it is, I understand where your, your question is. It's, it's a difficult one. And I don't think it's because we don't want to provide, it's just the need is so huge. And what our, our response to that need for the time being is what we can do. And I also don't blame the fact that not a lot of people want to go into a field when sometimes they are paid, you know, $20 an hour if they interpret on the phone. So for that responsibility. So it's, it's a complex issue. Yeah, one that deserves all our attention. So I hope we can keep working on it. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. uh, with this, uh, we're going to move on to the second speaker. Before I do that, I just want to make a little clarification. I noticed that um, the handouts that we're passing out, somehow only one page got copied. So we're missing the A's and the B's. <laughs> so it starts with a C as opposed to have some A's and some, and some B's. So uh, we'll be posting those on the on the website with all the other information. If there's anyone who really wants to who wants to look at that before the website is up and running, just uh, send us an email either um, one to me or to David Gramling, and we have the information on the on the information that you got to come here today. So just let us know, and we'll send you that. Otherwise, it'll be on the website. And I'm sorry for I don't know how that happened. Last minute kind of thing. We skip one page. Anyway. Our next speaker today is Dr. Edwin Gensler. He is a professor of comparative literature and director of the Translation Center at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He is the author of Translation and Identity in the Americans, New Directions in Translation Theory, published by Routledge in 2008, and also a classic in Translation Studies, Contemporary Translation Theories, Routledge 1993, which has actually uh, been issued in two revised versions, one and, and um, 2001 and another one 2003. Um, and has been translated into Italian, Portuguese, Bulgarian, Arabic, and Persian. Okay. He is the co-editor with Maria Simoco of Translation and Power and of numerous articles in, in journals such as uh, uh, TIS, Perspectives, Target, and Translation and Literature. He serves on a number of executive committees, uh, such as the NIDA Institute, the Advisory Committee for the NIDA School of Translation Studies. He is the co-editor with Susan Basnet of the Topics and Translation Series for Multilingual Matters. Uh, he's been doing that for 15 years. Um, he's edited over 20 volumes, and he was also one of the co-funders and executive committee members of ATISA, the American Translation and Interpreting Studies Association. He helped co-found two journals, Translation and Interpreting Studies, a thesis journal, TIS, which is published by Benjamins. And he is on the editorial board of a number of other journals, Massachusetts Review, Perspectives Across, Metamorphosis, and the Journal of Chinese Translation Studies. Again, without further delay, Dr. Edwin Gensler. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sonia, and thank you, David, uh, for having me down here. Uh, thank you, Dean Wildener Basnet. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. Uh, thanks, our distinguished panelists and our co sponsors, the German department in particular, Sev <laughs> Wudgemacht, and, uh, and um, all the audience members, of course. What a, what a pleasure it is to be here and to talk with you about uh, some of the things that uh, we're doing in translation studies. And whoever came up with the name for this Centering Translation uh, is a, a brilliant title. So uh, very seldom do I get to speak at any organization with translation to be centered. Uh, um, I'm going to talk very, uh, I want to just, uh, Sonia, uh, or uh, Claudia Angelelli's talk is uh, really good. She's one of the leading scholars of interpreting studies uh, in, in the world, as you can gather from the research. I was on the IMIA, it used to be the MMIA, and I was on that, those committees that started those certification 
exams from the very beginning. And I have to say, I was thrown out of many, many meetings. Uh, a 30-hour training, a 40-hour training, a uh, high school minimum degree to be interpreted. And a lot of the people in the room were those people who had been practicing interpreting for a long time in the United States. And they did not want somebody like me to come in, a university professor, and set the bar too high so that they would be legislated out of the profession. And it was a real tension. Uh, medical interpreting involves, as this questioner asked, you know, what does the, what's the doctor's perspective? What's, you have to know a very high level of professional discourse. You're not going to learn that with sort of an eighth grade education, being an immigrant in this country, or high school. It's, so we've developed at the University of Massachusetts an upper level undergraduate course. And it was designed by a doctor and an interpreter. And we teach uh, systems of the body. We teach medical procedures. We want the interpreter not just to know the terminology, but to know why is the doctor asking these questions? What is, you know, if there's a pulmonary problem, they need to know how the pulmonary system works and what might be going wrong with it and why. So, uh, uh, I've sort of split off from that. Well, I still attend their meetings, and they, with, they do a lot in Massachusetts still. Um, and there's some great people involved in that organization. We have some wonderful hospitals in the Boston area, the Dana-Farber Institute, uh, um, the UMass Medical Center in Worcester is, uh, is excellent. Um, so there are some wonderful people there, but there are also a lot of other people in the profession that are fighting for higher standards. I also want to say that her research is unique. Be able to follow around patients and interpreters for 20 months and collect this data to see not just what teachers say uh, 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 an interpreter should do, but to see what actually translators and interpreters are doing. It's unique. I've tried to get that research going at the University of Massachusetts and have been unsuccessful. Hospitals do not want the professors and the researchers in there, they're afraid of a lawsuit, they're afraid of a mistranslation and something going wrong. It's very hard to get those permissions. Uh, her study is pioneering, her data is pioneering, and it's changing, changing the whole field. Okay, I have some similar statistics. I'll fly through these. This is what I'm going to talk about. Multilingualism in the USA, multilingualism in Massachusetts, and then multilingualism and translation studies research. And this is very similar to uh, uh, Professor Angelelli's slide. 60 million people, or one out of five Americans, speak a limited or non-English language. And here are the top languages. And I was talking with Anthony Pym a little bit earlier. I learned my languages and translation in, in Europe, translation studies. And I started at the University of Massachusetts thinking that I would be God's greatest gift to translation studies in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, 93 languages are spoken. The top 10 languages are not the languages that we teach at the university. Right, so this is the problem that I inherited and all of us in translation here. And I'm sure you have similar problems here. And, um, but I have done so much. Uh, I have taught uh, Vietnamese word processing. I have taught how to write in standard Haitian Creole. I have done so many things that my academic training never prepared me for. And uh, I think we have people from the critical languages here. Uh, universities need to get more involved in not the standard languages that are taught at the university and help train people for the, the social problems and medical and legal problems and diversity problems and integration problems and cultural problems that we are experiencing. Uh, these are the source countries. In my research, this quick I talk, I went back and talked about translation, uh, translation and identity in America. Then I went back to pre-revolutionary war period, and I don't know. The Constitution had to be translated into six languages before it was ratified. Uh, Pennsylvania had over 40 percent of their population spoke German. Uh, uh, the United States has always been a multilingual country. This is not a new problem. It may seem new in Arizona, but it's, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you're certainly getting great headlines across the nation right now. I'm sorry. But you, you can see how things change. Here is a, a graph of 1970 and the languages that were predominant there. And you see Italian, Germany, Canada, Mexico's at 8%. Over here, you Mexico's up to 29%. Uh, Poland, Soviet Union, those disappear from the top 10 languages today. Uh, Cuba, Ireland, Austria. N look at the languages that we need today. Philippines, <coughs> Vietnam, El Salvador, Korea, Dominica, Cuba, Guatemala. All right, so the immigration patterns are changing and universities change very slowly. This is a problem. So how do we, in another 30 years or 40 years, it's going to be very d different again. Um, and then each state is different. I think everybody from Aristide's in a government in exile ended up in Boston and all of a sudden we had, we had an incredible problem of providing uh, Haitian Creole translation. Uh, growth of Chinese immigrants, you can see this, uh, it's growing from uh, doubling, tripling, quadrupling uh, uh, in just a short period of time. Um, this is the growth of the Spanish-speaking immigrants, which is one of the languages I'm sure you're facing here in, uh, here in Arizona. But you can see the growth uh, up 140% uh, over the last uh, three decades. Whereas in terms of the total population, immigration is up 33%. Or uh, the Spanish is up 210%, I'm sorry. The non-English speaking population in the United States is up 140 um, percent. I don't know, we're seeing it in elections now. Uh, in Boston we have a, uh, uh, a Spanish-speaking uh, city councilor, uh, uh, Felix Arrojo, and then we have uh, a Korean-speaking city councilor, Sam Yoon. So we're seeing real change going on here. Um, this is immigration by state and by city. Um, uh, I'm looking quite a bit at translation in cities, and uh, my research is showing that translation is more than just a linguistic problem, but it becomes uh, a way people who live in a city can manage that city, can survive when you, you talk to a publisher, you meet an immigrant group, or you speak to an architect, or you talk to a banker go from one neighborhood to another. So here are some of the cities that are uh, have a, a, a large uh, non-English speaking uh, population. And then you can see the state, uh, the dark red state is California, 25.4% uh, uh, foreign born there. The light red, which would be uh, Texas and Florida, nine to 10, 0.9%, and then the dark pink, Massachusetts and Arizona would be 2 to 5% of the population being foreign born. Um, this is the Mexican immigration, and you can see Massachusetts turns into a light pink, but Arizona goes into a, a, a darker pink. Um, so, um, um, Massachusetts has a large influx of the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rican. Our Spanish is very, very different than the Spanish spoken here. Um, and this is also a new trend in translation studies to look at uh, different uh, local populations and what they speak. So it's no longer in my translation center. We ask the client who is the audience for this. And is it a Puerto Rican Spanish? Is it a kind of a generic, neutral Latin American Spanish? Is it a peninsular Spanish? Is it a Mexican Spanish? And uh, we have translated, we even are doing Spanglish for a client in uh, Chicago. <laughs> but then there are different Spanglishes, of course. Uh, so uh, we have to, so in translation, um, this is perhaps driven by the industry more than by academia. The industry talks about localization. They're forcing institutions such as mine to begin uh, teaching this in the classroom. And we have a, a consultant, Patricia Gubatosi, who does uh, dialects of Spanish in, uh, 
and uh, Professor Kalina's work, which is also uh, very strong in this area. Um, this is the Chinese-born population in the United States. I just throw this out so that you can see that here, Arizona goes to a very, very light blue, but then you can see other states such as New York moving into a, a darker color. So the immigration patterns are, of course, very, very different. And this is just, uh, uh, the census is really only counting the, uh, the legal immigrants. Uh, there's so many illegal immigrants that aren't, uh, uh, aren't, aren't counted in, in, in many of these statistics. Um, so, uh, and here you can see, in terms of the estimated number of unauthorized immigrants, over 7 million are coming in from Mexico, 61% of the total, up 50% from uh, in the last eight years. But then you can also see some other numbers, Honduras, for example, 81% change, or Brazil, 72% change. In Massachusetts, we have an incredible amount of Brazilians. Mm -hmm. uh, the town of Newton, has been taken over by people from Minas Gerais. Uh, uh, they've taken over the downtown, they've taken over the shopping centers, they've taken over the car dealerships. They've done a wonderful job renovating the downtown, which was an old uh, factory town, old uh, uh, fabric and uh, garment uh, town, and they've completely renovated it. But they all come from the same local. Um, we have many other Brazilians and, uh, and other other towns in Massachusetts, um, and we do quite a bit of work in uh, Brazilian Portuguese. Um, unauthorized immigrants by state, and here you can see Arizona is in the top, what was that, top five, um, with uh, an, an estimated half a million um, unauthorized immigrants coming in. People, this is so hard to estimate though, these numbers, I mean, I mean, not, this is from, um, I don't know, a uh, DHS uh, library statistics uh, publication. Uh, these are all estimates, but I've seen estimates where the Chinese illegal immigrant population coming in is about 100,000 a year, um, which means that they would have increased in the last decade um, uh, by nearly a million. Um, I guess the talk that I want to give today is to sort of compare Arizona to Massachusetts. Uh, we had a, a very similar problem that Arizona is experiencing today in Massachusetts about uh, three decades ago. Um, and if you look at the immigration numbers, the size of the foreign-born population in 2010, Arizona is ranked 11th out of 50 states. 51 is the District of Columbia. Uh, whereas Massachusetts is ranked seventh out of 51. So we have a higher percentage of foreign born in our state than, than Arizona does. Percentage of foreign born of the total population, 13 out of 51 versus eight out of 51. Number change, the foreign born population in the last decade, 14th out of 51, 13th out of 51. Percentage change of foreign born population, 36th out of 51, 39th out of, so you can see the two states are in many ways very, very similar in terms of percentage of, of, of foreign born. Now, as I said, we went through this problem uh, a, a while ago, uh, 1980 to 1990. The Hispanic population in Massachusetts increased by 103.9%, the highest in the nation. I've seen, I did a little reading about Arizona where Arizona ranks in percentage of uh, people coming in. And it's very high. I've seen people say that it's the highest in the nation. Uh, it's very high. I think Georgia is actually higher than, uh, and I think Nevada is sort of tied with Arizona today. The Asian population in Massachusetts increased by 187%. The non-white population increased by 270% in Massachusetts. Massachusetts in the 90s, this is when I came in, came back from Europe and got my job at the University of Massachusetts. So I arrived right in the middle of this. Uh, between 86 and 91, the number of Hispanic prisoners more than doubled. 
Between 87 and 93, the number of Hispanic children in foster homes more than tripled. We had some real problems in the state of mass. It really breaks my heart to see these mostly Hispanic men behind jail. Maybe they get one chance to tell their story to a cop or to a judge. And if the interpreter is not, not very strong, that's their chance. And if they don't get it right, bang, away they go. And I don't know what's going on here in Arizona. From what we read in Massachusetts about what's going on, I don't even know if you're, they're getting that one chance to, to tell their story. Um, so this is when I come into the translation business in the state of Massachusetts. I arrived in 1994. All right. So in the state of Massachusetts, 93 languages are spoken. Our, the translation center that I took over translated about eight languages. So what I did was I, uh, well, I, I pretty much fired all of those people. <laughs> and I started recruiting my own group. And then I started recruiting in a, a, a whole new uh, a set of languages. Um, the top languages that we needed were Spanish, Portuguese, first and second, by a fairly substantial margin, and then Vietnamese, Khmer, Haitian Creole, Russian, French. Then you see the other European languages, French, German, and Italian, and it comes in the ocean. And the university, as I said earlier, was not training in these languages, and so I figured out ad hoc ways to get the quality of translation up in these languages, often doing workshops on weekends uh, myself. Um, new clients, more social services. The Translation Center tended to be a kind of a literary country club. We started offering uh, more social services, healthcare providers, small businesses. And the business people found out about us. This is something, universities have an incredible I don't know how many languages your students speak in the College of Humanities, but there's a tremendous resource of talent at universities, international student bodies, and then US students who have traveled. All right. And immediately our business grows. We've had years where we made a half a million, almost uh, 600, $650,000. And then I use that money as a little bit like Robin Hood. I give it to graduate students. And I give it to students studying minority languages. Um, so that's how we finance our graduate studies program. Uh, the Certificate Interpreting Studies, which existed at uh, UMass uh, before I started, was basically trying to train people to be interpreters at the UN. And what I did was I shifted that to so that they be uh, they'd start. None of the graduates ever translated at the UN, so we had a placement percentage of zero. <laughs> so I changed all of that and made it a, uh, a community interpreting healthcare, legal studies, social, mostly social services, uh, new language support in languages with limited infusion. Uh, I recruited people uh, to to um, to help give the students feedback in these uh, lesser lesser known languages, and then the cultural turn in translation studies. Uh, as uh, Professor Angela said, there's so many cultural problems from the minute uh, a person speaking limited English walks into the interpreting counter. And if you can relieve some of those tensions and anxieties before the interpreting studies encounter, uh, you have a much better chance of success. Ethical problems, internships, international exchange programs. The MA in Translation Studies that did exist at UMass, but they hadn't had a graduate in that program for about 10 years. So I dusted that off and we entered, we started a cultural studies component, we introduced new technology courses, we, it used to be literary primarily, we added other kinds of uh, projects that we would accept, did a lot more theory and practice. Um, and then there's new faculty, we just hired two new faculty uh, this uh, this fall, uh, wonderful professor of uh, interpreting studies, Moira Ingaleri, and a new professor who's doing research on cities in translation, especially uh, she's taught a course on New York. She's going to teach a course on Barcelona and on Havana. Uh, Regina Galasso. Um, partnership with the trial court. Uh, we got a three quarter of a million dollar grant with the trial court to develop a three year program in. Uh, uh, court interpreting, and then we offered that 
not just at UMass, but uh, via distance learning in Springfield and Boston. And we taught Spanish to court employees across the state. And uh, then we, I helped design and implement a state certification program in legal interpreting. And I modeled, I see uh, Jaime Fatas is here. I modeled our state exams on the federal exam here in Arizona. Although I have to say our pass rate is a little higher than the rate here. It's a tough federal exam. So ours, uh, I think our curves, uh, the grading is a little easier. Um, and we designed court interpreting exams in Spanish and in Portuguese and Khmer. You offer here, I guess it's Spanish. Who's from the NCI here? Anybody? What languages do you certify here? The NCI offers certificates in Spanish, and up until very recently in Navajo. Navajo. Yeah. 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 It's in the country that offer any training for Navajo. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I had a split job. I worked half time in Compton and half time in uh, directing the translation center. So I teach in comparative literature, and that was great. Everybody in my department translated or or had written about translation. There was no sort of marginalization or prejudice against what it was that I was doing at all. Uh, but we've done so many things. We've opened and we had a requirement that our students had to either know German or French to get into the program. So that was the first thing I jettisoned. Um, but we now have students in these languages. Uh, um, and then uh, we started student conferences and we started new courses. Um, and um, now we're starting to, our best graduates we're sending on to do a PhD. So um, they, they have to reapply into comparative literature, but I have a pretty good chance of getting them in because I'm on that committee. All right. The partnership with state and national organizations, uh, we hosted the second ATISA conference and our relationship with ATISA has been just brilliant. What a chance to find out what other research is going on in the United States. This is a wonderful organization. Uh, if you haven't found out about it, uh, let uh, either Professor Colina or Angela Ali know, they'll get you on the mailing list. That's a, we do work with IMIA, uh, we do partner with ATA, uh, we developed this medical interpreting course which we offer via distance learning. Uh, we collaborate with the Office of Refugees and Immigrants. Uh, uh, we cooperate with the Mass Law Reform. We have this coalition in Massachusetts called the Babel Coalition. So uh, anytime legislation comes up that's uh, disadvantageous to the people who we think need help. We have this lobbying group already together. And uh, um, it's just great. And we've gotten an interpreter services bill through Massachusetts. I think it's one of the only ones in the nation uh, where uh, if you have a certain percentage of non-English speaking people in the community of your hospital, then the hospital has to provide qualified interpreting services for those people in emergencies rooms uh, and in a couple of other places. Uh, I think it's the first of its kind in the nation. It's very difficult to get that through because everybody was telling us, how much is this going to cost? We didn't know. <laughs> Once you start offering these services, people will come. So, um, so it was very, it took a long, long time to get that through. Okay, I'm going to fly through some of this other stuff. My own reach, research. This is a book I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, new definitions of where scholars are studying. And I take this from uh, Emily Apter. Uh, translations is a geographical space, diasporic language communities, border cultures, print media spheres, department programs, and in universities. The politics of all of this, government involvement in domestic and international policies, translation in the military, foreign policy, and then the psychological space. Translations studies is getting very, very interested in exploring the repercussions of both providing translations and then not providing translations on individuals. So this is a direction we're going. i end with this quote. Uh, One of the reasons why there's so much poverty and ghettoization 
In the USA is that people who do not fit invariably of a different color, ethnicity, culture, and language are often cast aside. Examples include Amer Indians relegated to reservations, Chinese centralized in Chinatowns, blacks in urban ghettos, Latinos in barrios, many minorities, including men, mostly men incarcerated. With no translation policy, no policy of median, mediation and negotiation, there's no other place to put them. And I argue the expulsion is never complete. Monolingualism always includes multilingualism, although it's deceptive because it hides in the multilingual fabric upon which it rests. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for about, I think, about one question before we need to move on. Does anybody have the, the burning question that I'm not seeing? Yes. Uh, I was in Massachusetts when he was a court interpreter in Massachusetts they, before you stole him from us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have uh, two pieces of uh, information that I would like to share with you. One is that I was the president of the Judicial Interpreters of Massachusetts when ju the judiciary in Massachusetts decided to implement uh, throughout the state service in order to provide interpretation services in the courthouses. I, rem I think that we went from providing over 7,000 linguistic interventions the year prior to the implementation of the service to more than 80,000 the year after, while saving millions of dollars to the taxpayers, wow. just by deploying interpreters in courthouses and court complexes where there was a high demand for those services. So it's not only the right thing to do, but it also saves a lot of money. And there was uh, somebody here who had, uh, asked us to, how do we measure satisfaction uh, with interpreting services and providers and patients? I'll give you one example, one local example. There is just one uh, hospital that I know of in the metropolitan area here in Tucson, that is Tucson Medical Center, that has professional interpretation services. They launched that service a few years ago under the International uh, Services Department, and they've been posting profits consistently every year just because the community realizes that they can communicate, that they are being better served, and they're actually attracting business from Mexico. So <clears throat> there is it certainly money, but it also delivers better justice and delivers better health care. Sure. And what I found working with judges, and I met frequently with the chief, uh, the Supreme Court justices of the state of Massachusetts, is that they were very nervous about these statistics of Latinos incarcerated and kids in foster homes. They were not happy with the delivery of justice. You have many, many allies in hospitals and courts. Uh, uh, and it does save money. And if I may add, uh, besides being the right thing to do, liability for hospitals is a big issue. We have recent cases where, because of lack of the provision of interpretation or interpretation or errors, uh, hospitals have been sued, and they had to pay multi-million settlements in order to settle those cases. Recently, $71 million in, in a hospital in Florida, two hospitals in New Mexico, several in California. So but just put the numbers together. How many interpreters can like, you provide in a hospital with $71 million and $50,000 uh, per head? So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and we're going to turn to our last speaker, but I, I want to remind you that there is uh, food and light refreshments afterwards. So if you're starting to get a hankering, it's coming in about a half hour or so. Um, my. I got to know the work of Anthony Pym while I was doing my own doctoral work, and I have to say quite honestly that he, his work really revolutionized the way I think about texts and, and multilingualism and translation. So, and he visits Tucson uh, just about as often as my own family does, and we're really grateful for that, so it's really nice to have you back. I'm going to just uh, read this really quick. Anthony Pym is professor of translation and intercultural studies 
um, and coordinator of the Intercultural Studies Group at the uh, Rovira y Virgili University in Tarragona, Spain. Uh, he runs a doctoral program in translation and intercultural studies. He's also president of the European Society for Translation Studies, a fellow of the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies, visiting researcher at the Monterey Institute for International Studies, and this is my favorite, uh, my uh, professor extraordinary at the University of Stellenbosch, uh, a title to which I certainly aspire. <laughs> uh, his most recent book, uh, and it pains me to say that I haven't read it, is On Translation Ethics. This is uh, John Benjamin's, uh, Benjamin's 2012. Uh, a warm welcome, please, for Professor Anthony Kramer. Yes. Thank you very much, David, Sonia, Dean, enlightened all. <laughs> Especially, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but this is a very prestigious bunch of people to be next <laughs> to. Uh, Claudia is, is president of the American Translation Studies, Translation and Interpreting Studies Association. Uh, so the two continents meet here. Uh, and Edwin is the mainstay, has been for a long time, a key figure. American translation studies and beyond, as I'm sure you can appreciate from what he's been saying there. I'm going to do something entirely different, but it will pick up from where Edwin left off. Um, I'm going to confess my shortcomings. Now, I once believed, as some of you might, that translation and interpreting involve an utterance over there in one language and an utterance over there in another language and a sort of similarity, equivalence, something between the two where we can trust that this represents that. Is that what it is? Well, yes. <laughs> but I once believed that that was all there was. Okay? And I'm no longer there. Now, this is not a story of salvation. It's not, I was lost and now I am found. No. I thought I was found. And now I know I'm lost. <laughs> I want to tell you why that this questioning, my main questioning is the balance between these two things. Most of the models we have of translation interpreting involve two sides. Text, utterance, culture, language, whatever you want, and some little guy in the middle that's got to do a balancing act of some kind. Now, the thing that's bothering me is the overwhelming evidence of asymmetry of imbalance in that relationship. And that's what's bothering me. It's got me into, it would be a midlife crisis, but I'm too old for that. Now. It's sort of, at the very stage of my career where I'm supposed to be defending positions, it, it's all crumbling beneath me. I'm going to present four instances. Now you, Edwin likes it when I confess. Yeah? <laughs> four instances of, of not stuff I know, Things I would like to know more about. Okay, where I think I would like to know more research that can help me with my existential asymmetric problem. <laughs> but the first is this. Um, in recent years, not so recent, 10 years, we've got a lot of information on cognitive processes of translators, written translators in this case. And this comes from uh, Think About Protocols, um, screen recording, translog, and, and this is eye tracking, okay? You are going to see a person translate here. I've stolen this from Aunt Jakobsen in Copenhagen, where they do a lot of this research, Copenhagen Business School. Um, now, I was taught, and I teach, that the unit of translation is the sentence, and that you get the meaning of the sentence, and then you put it in another sentence, right? Let's see what happens, if it works. I was also taught that the difference between written translation and interpreting, conference interpreting, is simultaneity. There's also the inability to do repairs, but interpreters do repairs. And Anyway, watch. No, don't watch. Oh, down there. Yeah. There we go. We're off. The, the blue is the person's eye. Okay, here we are reading. 
So it's nothing new in eye tracking. You know, reading research has been around for a long time. We just didn't bother to apply it to translation. It's like all the education stuff we never bothered to apply. <laughs> We've got something. Now, how many units were processed? The eye went to the end of the sentence. But now look, we're in a process of something like trout fishing. You see these guys in the street, you know, with a fly? You go out there and catch a bit of meaning and bring it back in? No, there's nothing there. Oh, we've got to go back and get some more. Watch the, for simultaneity. You will find moments when the hands are writing and the eye is reading. What's that if not simultaneity? Something else is happening there. Okay? Good. That's all there is. That's all there is. Now, a lot of research is done on this sort of stuff, using this tool, comparing novices with professionals or experts. Many different definitions, it doesn't matter. This is intriguing research. If we can define the differences between the novices and the professionals, we can define what we should be training people in. After all, our teaching is to get people from there to there, in many cases. And you can define the parameters according to your market. Edwin's obviously got different market out there from, from what we'd have in Monterey, where we're training for a State Department and nasty governments here and abroad and all over the place. Uh, and we had a list of findings, things we're fairly sure about. Now, those findings can be summarized something like the following. The more experienced the subject, the, the translator, the more time they spend looking at the target side, the translation. The faster they read, but they don't actually translate faster. The more experience they have, the more time they spend revising or reviewing that is, looking at the target side. They make fewer changes, but they spend longer to find them. The more experience they have, the more they can say about the client and the instructions and the way they translate it, looking at the target side. In sum, the more experienced they are, the more their attention and their cognitive activity is happening on one side than the other. This fundamental attitude. It's not reasoned that way, because the people doing the research believe in theories of, of purpose or scopos, uh, and theories of functionalism, and theories of context. So they say, uh, with more experience, people incorporate more context into the cognitive process and are related more to the purpose of the translation, the communicative function to be achieved rather than the textual material. All of that is true. But still, my concern is, why is it happening more one side than the other? Why this fundamental asymmetry? End of my first question. They've explained what's there, but I want to know why. Second question. This is a colleague in Monterey, now in, uh, in Rico University in, in Japan, at uh, Kayoka Takeda, a few years ago came in with this, this observation that why is it that my, my best conference interpreting students, the best ones, from Japanese English, between Japanese English, why is it these are the ones who learnt the language, the second language, late in life? Why is it that the heritage speakers are not getting to the top level? Uh, well, yeah, okay, but I've been asking around. That's quite common. I went last week, Spanish section. He said, yeah, yeah, three, three heritage speakers dropped out last, in the last semester. And, uh, and, uh, and Kayoko's got the data. You know, she can show this happening quite clearly. We don't know why. But my suspicion is, Sonia might say because they didn't learn about translating early enough when they were learning. Mm -hmm. But my suspicion is that when you're learning a language late, <coughs> It's not like learning a language, a language orally early. You're learning not only the written language, which is important, but also you're incorporating a whole lot of mapping procedures. Because you are working from L1 to L2. Whether or not you're supposed to, according to the pedagogical theory of the moment. <laughs> it means that when you're learning late, you are using translation to learn, secretly perhaps. 
<laughs> but should it be any surprise that those mapping operations you've incorporated come out so quickly when you have to translate? Should it be any surprise that when we get those elder, early learners, people who are fully bilingual, and they're thrown into that situation where they have to mediate between the two, they have real trouble. It's not just, I suspect, they haven't been trained enough. Not that they have to learn the alien eye and various linguistic devices or go for 30 hours of ethics as if that were sufficient. <laughs> I suspect that the late learner has incorporated automatically this fundamental asymmetry. They are better at one language than the other, usually. And that that asymmetry maps onto the asymmetry I'm finding in a professional experience. I have no doubt of <laughs> at all. This is not an empirical lesson on how to do research. It's just, I would love you to go out and tell me about that. <laughs> Find out about that, please. Help me with my problem of why this asymmetry. My third question. Oh dear, this is going to get... These are not my gloves. <laughs> <laughs> they work. They work. <laughs> Now you can see. I'm going to get you now. <laughs> <laughs> see the light. Christ is over. <laughs> My third question is, is, is getting back to strong, serious translation theory of the kind that, that has alterity or otherness or foreignness at its base. Okay? Uh, one example would be Quine, who had this wonderful thought experiment, extremely influential. The, the jungle linguist goes out to describe a hitherto unknown language. I'm sure you all know about this. And uh, finds a native. Rabbit runs by, native points, says Gavagai, and linguist writes down Gavagai equals rabbit. Right? Translation equivalence, right? And then Quine goes through all the possible areas of doubt. You know, what do you mean rabbit? It means, look, my dinner. Look uh, how fast he runs. Lo, a, fee, a, a flea on the rabbit's right ear, or something like that. I mean, and he goes through all the ways we could attempt to reduce the indeterminacy of the utterance and concludes that it is impossible, that there is always indeterminacy or uncertainty, that we don't know for sure what is there. All right, that's fair enough. Now, and, and that's uh, been very influential for me. It can be attached to the deconstruction of thrust and the interpretative moment and hermeneutics and everything else you want to do there. That's, that's fine. I was worried about, well, the asymmetry is clear, okay? One guy's got a pen and is writing down, and the other is just pointing at a rabbit, which got away. Uh, so, you know, one guy's got the power and the other guy's hungry. Uh, it's a colonial situation. <laughs> in the dead, in the, in the jungle. Why are rabbits in jungles, anyway? <laughs> okay, there's all that, but then I went back to the text. And Quine actually writes there that this thought experiment never actually happens. He says, a chain of interpreters, marginal interpreters, he recognizes, can be recruited across the darkest archipelago. There is never this virginal primal contact with the other. We are always... I always said almost already, but you know what I mean. There is always that first contact there. There is not this first contact with the other. Now, I've been reading this. Every translation theorist in the United States, including Edwin, um, makes much of Walter Benjamin's essay on, on the task of the translator. And we find a lot of things written about that essay on the basis of the importance of foreigners, of not communicating, of the mysticism. And, but I'm reading it in terms of my problem of symmetry and asymmetry. What is the relation between languages in this essay, in this hermeneutic, profoundly hermeneutic view of, uh, of, of translation? And I get stuck. This is, I've used this before, but I've extended it. Edwin would be pleased. This passage where, where Benjamin points out that the German term brot and the French term pain both mean bread of some kind. We can't doubt that. But, you know, there is 
a relation to be established there. But, says Ben Newman, the way they mean it, the art des minus, the way of meaning, is entirely different. Oh, we get stuck on that. Now, I've been wondering about bread, French bread, German bread, baguette, uh, rye bread. Wonder bread. You think it's, it's because there are different cultures there and different ways of, of making bread and stuff. Now, that essay was published as the introduction to a translation of the Tableau Parisien as part of Baudelaire's uh, Les Fleurs du Mal. And um, so I went through Les Fleurs du Mal and I found bread. It's only there two places. Uh, one, La Muse Vénale, where it's uh, a prostitute who goes out to earn her evening bread. Uh, son pain de chaque soir. It's a lovely line. Where does that come from? To earn your evening bread. Does it, does it sound like something you heard? Vivaces they are daily bread, yes. It's a pun on the daily bread. And then the other poem, the La Benediction, it's the, the maudit, the, the, the decadent poet who is dressed up as an anti-priest. And uh, we have a reference to le pain et le vin, le vin et le pain, the bread and wine. Where does bread and wine come from? In a poem called Benediction. Uh-huh. <laughs> My point is that you think that in translating this text, it's the two art des minus, it's the two ways of meaning of French and German that are coming together. But if you look at the example, it's the Christian church that has structured that semantic field quite explicitly, pre-structured it, in the cases where it appears. Now, the only bit of advance I've got is that I've looked at, at Benjamin's translations, and I found bread in a place that there isn't there. Talk about asymmetry. Um, it, it, it's a completely different text uh, where uh, Baudelaire is talking about, uh, once again, a rather suspicious-looking woman, woman who uh, is like a, a verre qui dérobe l'homme de ce qu'il mange, uh, a worm that eats away at what humanity eats. What happens in Benjamin? What it's eating, this worm, is this mentions Heglish Brot, man's daily bread. Christian church, Christian reference, pre-structure of the field. There is no primal contact there. There may be a symmetry, but in the text it's not a symmetry. And my, my horrible suspicion, and in this I concord with uh, Marilyn Gannis Rose's uh, analysis of, of, of another text, not the one I've been looking at, and Hans Vermeer's analysis of, uh, or comments on, uh, on, on Benjamin's actual translations. He was a much better theorist than he was a translator, and Benjamin's main problem there was getting a rhyme. <laughs> 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 and my, my deep suspicion, uh, my horrible suspicion, I hope this is not true, I've got to work on this more, tell me more, tell me that the art that's mine was not just a problem of how to get German to rhyme like French. Full stop, <laughs> but let us move on. Um, the, the point to make is that a lot of the theories we're taking at face value and use to, to build very poetic, elegiac things about respect for the other, welcoming the other in, uh, appreciating foreigners, constructing hybridity between equals. You get down and look at the text and look at the text in the way they're functioning, as a deconstructionist would, you find that anything that looks symmetrical has been constructed on, on an asymmetry that can be recuperated. My fourth and final source of doubt, um, for circumstances beyond my control, or because of them, I've been thrust into interest in the Vatican, the Catholic Church. <coughs> Wonderful group of, they have a veritable series of theses, treatises on translation going from Vatican II right up to the current day. And, and the, current, the one that's currently in force, as you might imagine, if you know anything, if you're a Catholic, um, uh, Liturgicum Authenticum, is um, rather uh, restrictive. I'm being very polite here. <laughs> 
in what you can do with the liturgy. But it's framed within a, a greater theory, a cultural theory of translation, which goes by the name of inculturation. And the basic idea here, in, not n, inculturation, is that whatever you're doing when you're translating, it's not between two separate cultures that have the same status. They're very clear. This is like, you know, lucid colonialism. In inculturation, one culture is incorporated into the culture of the church. Ah. And the church culture is transformed as a result. It's internally enriched. Uh, and in texts from the 1990s, you find a re a re the Catholic Church rewriting its own history as the history of translation. Yeah, we had Jewish thought, and then we integrated the Greek thought, and Augustine came in and did this. You know, and so on. This is, this is great stuff. It's not, this is why it's asymmetric, perhaps. But it's just another source of questions. It's not two cultures or two languages meeting. It is, for them, in their theory, one culture taking over the other and being enriched. The way the Roman poets freely recognized that Greek culture had been incorporated in, in, into Latin culture. This has been worrying me. I work for the European Union in many indirect ways and some not so indirect. And I think, well, what am I doing? Am I trying to protect the English language and protect Spanish? No, it doesn't happen. It all becomes Euro-English and Euro-Spanish. No, that's it. The European Union does the same thing. It grows and incorporates new languages, new cultures, and brings it into its fold and is enriched through translation. The fundamental model isn't one language against the other, one culture against the other. It's the one culture growing. Oh, dear me, that's frightening. We don't want to stay there. So I thought, well, you know, if that's the only game in town, then globalization is finished and we all have one culture. And some writers actually say this. Uh, Grace, in his commentary on Quai, uh, says this almost in passing. Oh, it's all Western culture now. Hmm. And I thought, well, wait a minute. If there's inculturation, what else can I find? Is there anything like outculturation? <laughs> Exculturation? Well, I wrote a book on uh, translators and intercultures in Mexican history. And there's one chapter I actually argue that Mexican culture, such as we have it, uh, has proceeded from the intercultural groups, the translation mediating groups, mainly a bilingual legal system and, and a, a priestly cast of, of bilingual and trilingual monks. Uh, and that from that overlap, they developed a new culture. Other examples, uh, research by uh, Jean-Marc Guanvic on um, science fiction, traces the way uh, science fiction moved out of French, you know, Jules Verne and all that stuff, into the American novel, was reworked and then translated back and reinforced itself like that, separating from other genres. Uh, uh, Keith Harvey's doctoral thesis was on the gay novel, remarkably enough doing the same thing. Uh, the, the, the Americans using the prestige of French, the model of the French, to produce their novels which were translated back and held up as models. Uh, different things can happen. Translation can be used in many different ways. In this use of translation, the model here, it's used to lever a particular sector away from the dominant systems around it to produce a new genre. Much as the way international translation studies itself constructs a prestigious center in many versions, which then gets exported and reconstructed in a periphery, precisely in order to lever people away from departments of literature and linguistics. But perhaps I go too far. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, these are simple questions. I, I've also come to admit, <laughs> well, it's interesting to apply theories of translation as actively transforming the relations between cultures and to admit that we are not immune from that process. That this is, is what we're engaged in, whether or not we like it. I'll also freely admit there are things like metacultures. The European court, for example, takes in representatives of member states transformed things with a legal language uh, over a period of 10 years, 
such that after 10 years, the court then takes the member states and sues them. Uh, what was principal agent, the agent becomes a principal and dominates. Translation is playing a key role in that formation of a metaculture. And then finally, if there are metacultures, why not subcultures? Young students in China have excellent English. How did they get it? And their professors never got it. Spoken English, I mean. They're all watching American soap operas, God help us. <laughs> on illegal websites that are closed down and appear in another place and closed down. On fan sub, uh, subtitles, create really creative subtitles done for free. A whole subculture is within, below, transforming the entire academic culture, I'm sure, and the level of English to nobody. There you have it, my four questions. I'm not going to tell you I've discovered anything at all. I'm just in this crisis, which tells me that translation is what it always was, but it's become a lot more interesting as well. Thank you. <laughs>
machine translation nowadays with you know, Google Translate, what kind of um, what kind of effects those are going to have on the different points you talked about? <laughs> um, thank you for your question. I think that um, machine translation, like my link, multilingualism and everything else, is here to stay. And so the impact that we are seeing a lot is in how it's modifying the way we are teaching translation. It's one of those variables that comes and that now is asking of us to teach translation in a different way. So the role of the translator, we continue teaching, but now the, the translator needs to also be equipped to deal with the fact that he may be doing a lot of post-editing jobs, for example. It also impacts, and this is my take, in, in issues of um, what gets translated and what doesn't, and power and uh, access and, and whatnot. And then the issue of the quality. Mm -hmm. So it impacts every, every issue, because in quality we measure the quality of the output, and then uh, how many times are we able to do something with the quality of the output and how many times it goes out as is and it generally um, causes problems with the same sector of the population that doesn't need to have any more problems. I can pass the mic. Yeah, the technology is changing on this. They used to have many programs doing that kind of deep code recode and uh, all of those programs tended to fail except perhaps a program that's translating weather uh, predictions in Canada. Um, but now Google's, on, Google's in, in the game. And nobody ever thought that we'd have that kind of massive memory. And as more and more data goes in, Google Translate gets better and better. Right now it's still very primitive. Uh, you really can't use it. Uh, I guess it makes Two or three mistakes every sentence. Mm -hmm. My students would turn that in; it would they'd fail. I mean, <laughs> the post editing problem is humongous. But then you see you see a news report from the Middle East, and then all of a sudden it's Google translated and it's out there, and then they put it up on a wiki, and then all of a sudden the post editing gets done by wiki up, and it, the, each time somebody makes a pass at it, it gets better and better, and the speed in which some of these news reports are turning around and going international is quite remarkable. So we we have to we have to watch that technology and then the practice as well. So it's uh, it's worth watching. I have an article on my website that argues that machine translation with translation memories and with collaborative networks and feedback. It's going to change every aspect of translators' activity. And I believe the change is extremely positive. I can show data for most language pairs that it's more productive and higher quality for a translator to post-edit than to translate from scratch. That's actually quite easy to demonstrate. Uh, the big step, though, is that we're going to have translation as a far more social activity carried out by non-professionals. We're going to have to adapt our mindset to work with the non-professionals. And rejoice that a lot more material is going to get translated, and a lot more people are going to have fun with translation. I really am uh, very much uh, looking forward to the future where Google Translate and others uh, get even more used. By my students, too. <laughs> Let's keep that microphone over there, okay, and then we have one more question. First of all, thank you guys so much for being here. We're all really excited to hear what you have to say. Um, my question stems from Dr. Angelelli's uh, talk on medical interpretation specifically. Uh, during your research when you said that about 92% of hospitals are opting for the telephonic interpreting services, if I am correct in that number, um, during your research when you were talking to administrators, if you were to uh, ask them about their concerns about potential negative consequences due to uh, poor quality interpretation through telephonic services as opposed to using certified and higher qualified uh, medical interpreters, what, if any, response did you get from those administrators? Um, and that question also goes to the other guests. Um, 
particularly Dr. Gensler and your work with the Translation Center uh, at UMass Amherst with different, uh, not just hospitals, but with different markets. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to take the question in different parts. Um, what, what I said, I reported on a survey from 2006 where the participants in the service reported to have 92% um, of those use telephone interpreting, right? So um, then, in terms of quality, I can report what happened in, in the ethnography <coughs> I conducted where at the time it was the first hospital in the United States that was wired and offered uh, interpreting on the speaker phone so that the healthcare provider and the patient were face to face in the room and the interpreter was in a remote was acting remotely from a trailer on a telephone. So this and then in the same time that hospital couldn't cover all the number of interactions that they needed with the ten interpreters on site for Spanish, they would hire outside services from language line companies and whatnot that are offering um, interpreting on the phone. So I could observe the two parts. When a staff interpreter would be interacting from a phone within the hospital and when an outside interpreter from a company would be called in. Um, and your question is, what if I have asked managers about the quality, what their response was? And I was very surprised, and maybe I was naive, that the only concern this manager expressed was that quantity went up, productivity went up, and that was great for him. So all of the newsletters that I was gathering from the hospital showing productivity going up, the numbers looked good. So um, when I sat down with transcripts, and I sat down with interpreters because I wanted to get their, their perspective of what I was seeing going on, to get the emic perspective from the researcher, after so many months becoming the perspective, or trying to become the perspective of the observer, uh, the interpreters were explaining to me why certain things were happening. And when we were conferencing with the manager, that was not seen as a problem. So in terms of quality, A, which is really surprising, there was no quality control. As there is no quality control in many areas and many hospitals today, and there is some quality control in companies offering telephonic interpreting. However, it's used mostly for training purposes than for really quality control. So I'm afraid I cannot answer your question with data, but uh, you know, that's the situation that we have. Yeah, the data on this is all over the place. I had one MA thesis on telephone interpreting. For example, one of the questions that I asked this student to research was, how much of a translation counter is visual and how much is audio. And the research is all over the place, depending upon the scholar and the study and the group and the encounter and the language. It's, it ranges, some scholars say that there's 10, 15 percent is visual and 8, 9, 90, 80, 90 percent is audio. You see other studies where it's 50, 50, and I've seen <coughs> other studies where it's, and we just don't have the data. And, Professor Pim's work on eye tracking is, we really have to get some more data in on this. Um, hospitals tend to use this cost to quality uh, assessment. And it's very different than what we use in the classroom and teaching. Uh, they have a very, very different assessment tool. We do provide it. There are some hospitals uh, and healthcare service providers in upstate New York, New Hampshire, Maine that are so far away from any population group that they cannot get people up there. So we do it when it's better than nothing. But we do tell them it's the quality is down. I mean, if I hit Anthony hard in the arm, break his arm, and I, uh, the doctor asks him, does it hurt if I press here? And he's very macho about it. He says, no, it doesn't hurt at all. What? But he's grimacing. No, it doesn't hurt. If that, there's a, so much of a, any communication encounter that's visual uh, that uh, it really helps to have that person in the room. And as Professor Angelali says, managing that interpreting encounter, seeing in the eyes when something is not understood, and then intervening to ensure the smooth flow of the communication. If I may add one thing, I, um, 
What I noticed in the situation of, of the two uh, monolingual interlocutors together in the room was that all of a sudden, the provider was becoming the eye of the interpreter in the sense that exactly what you just uh, said, the patient would say, it hurts here, pointing at, at the right elbow, right? And so many times the provider is looking at the patient in the eye and it's looking at the patient. Many times the provider is writing notes. And so sometimes there were these instances when the here became like, it took two or three turns to be clarified or sometimes was missed. So that to me was a, a problem in the sense that now we are adding another layer of complexity as if it wasn't enough to have, you know, a person remote and whatever, but now to having, you know, ears and eyes that were not matching. Now I have to say that if you ask me about quality within my data comparing the when the interpreter was face to face and when the interpreter was on the phone, I couldn't say that the interpreters on the phone were of less quality, the interactions were of less quality. But of course we are talking about staff interpreters train in that way, to do the job in that way, it's quite different from when somebody's jumping from the outside and being called in. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Pim. Um, a few months ago, there was a public hearing um, in the federal government, all these agencies came and uh, expressed, well, admitted that there is a defic defic deficiency in language capabilities within the federal government. And all of these agencies, the representatives pointed to the, the looked at the, um, the representative from the Department of Education and said, we have this deficiency because we don't, we don't learn second languages at early stages. And today you said that um, people who learn languages at a later age, later time, they do, they're better translators, right? Did, did I understand that correctly? They do... I have no doubt. <laughs> so I guess my question is, is that a new research? I mean, can you point me to that, um, you know, any reference or anything? When you write it, I'll, I'll sign it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I will. <laughs> um, is, is that the question? Though? Yes, yes. I, I think. It's I mean, very, I agree with you, and I would like I, to get know, some. But, but but it's a very valuable point to make that language resources are all around us. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, in Australia, since you, you picked up on Australia in, in the nineteen nineties. Valverde wrote a thing of language threats, but she pointed out that the Australian companies that were exporting to Southeast Asia, China, Japan, okay, um, had employees, had people there who knew the languages. Mm -hmm. and all we had to do was, was to get them to do the, the translating and interpreting. Mm -hmm. Failed dismally. Because somebody on the shop floor doesn't have the language to the level required to sell the product. Okay, so there's it's true, there are resources all around us, and the point being made that, that a big university in this country has lots of languages among students is a very good one. Mm -hmm. okay? But it's not generally true that, that having people who speak many languages since childhood is going to help you communicate and export and, mm -hmm. and control the world's politics and economy and whatever else this country wants to control. Well, thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Um, this goes to everybody on the panel, but specifically coming from Dr. Angeli's presentation. And I was just wondering, do, do you see any opportunities of helping to better the education of interpreters in the field and um, to better to make better quality um, accessible to everybody? Thank you for your question. Um, plenty of opportunities. Um, when, when the Dean was asking the role of a College of Humanities, um, I think it is within the university where we can offer a variety of options for students who can be full-time, who can be part-time, who can only come on the weekends, who can only do things online. But um, as the program that Edwin was mentioning, if we are going to think in terms of healthcare and access to healthcare, then moving from traditional programs and crash courses and, and 
and programs that we cannot really um, really say that they are making any difference to teaching students ways of speaking within the healthcare. So how do doctors talk? Why do they do certain things? Teaching them knowledge of subject matter, teaching them about ethics and their responsibilities, and teaching. So I can envision a curriculum where you go from practice to teaching. We need teachers of healthcare interpreters, so we need, we need to, um, to teach practitioners, we need to teach teachers, and we need to teach researchers. So we need students that will go and impact policy for uh, minority speakers, access and whatnot. We need students that will become the teachers of medical interpreting in the university and community colleges and whatnot. And we need practitioners that, that are well-round um, formed so that, that they can cope with the activity that they have in hand. It's really, uh, it's very difficult. We tend to think Sometimes, and I don't want to generalize, but oh, conference interpreting is so hard, and medical interpreting, you know, just because it's, you know the terms and you can just do it. And no, because you move from field to field and you're dealing with big decisions. Sometimes they are life and death, sometimes they are cultural misunderstandings, sometimes they are ethical issues of organ donation and whatnot, and when is it appropriate to ask that question and according to what culture and, and without stereotyping but really giving the student an understanding of of the words, the culture, the discourse community, the discourse community of patients and the discourse community of healthcare providers that are very different and for the interpreter to be able to navigate both. So yeah, there are tons of ways to improve what we are doing. I think we may have time for one or two questions. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'm not quite sure how I want to phrase this question. I worked as an over-the-phone interpreter for a couple of years. Um, really, it seems to me the economy, everything in the world is tending towards privatization. We're trying to make costs uh, lower. We're trying to, even in the medical field, we see that everything's tending towards a uh, tendency to have cheaper health care, doctors that take on, that are less personalized, Everything is tending towards that. Uh, personally, as I was working there, I thought the quality of interpretation was deplorable. I guess really the question that I have for the panel is, how do we instill that that professionalism in interpretation? How do we go from uh, a company that is willing to pay interpreters $11 an hour and provide a good enough product, and we have companies that are willing to pay a cheaper price for a good enough product, how do we bridge that gap and get to a point where we can have more of a professional uh, career and really kind of, I don't know, I'm not quite sure how, what I'm trying to ask, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> and then I pass it on to you both. Um, this is a tough question. It's not because I'm avoiding answering it, but let me, I'll put it cold first and, and then we'll take it from there. Um, we all have teeth, we are not all dentists. Or we all have hands, we are not all pianists. Um, I've worked for a long period of time with medical interpreters and I've seen medical interpreters that have had no education in medical interpreting, that wasn't available, had high school and had doctors in their own country, and they range in how they perform. Some were doing great jobs, some were not. The problem is, if we don't invest in an education, but at the same time the education is not available. So we first try to make it available and then invest in the education so that we can be called professionals. Because what I see is a lot of individuals who are doing uh, their best and, and they really want to help, but their resources are limited. And then we, we see them interacting with an industry where quality is not the main concern, or is in some senses it is a concern, but it's not the main one. The main one is cost. If we can make it efficient and work. I, I followed this issue in Spain and in Great Britain when all of a sudden, the, for example, interpreting in the courts was through a, a process of bidding was given to one company and that one company was not watching quality, so it would, on the bid, have interpreters with credentials. But then the jobs would be done by different types of interpreters, and the ones that were charging less would be the ones that got more jobs. So it is a problem that I would say, let's not qualify it simple to answer, easy or difficult. It can be done, but it requires 
that we look at all of those areas. I would not like to put the burden on medical interpreters have to go through college of four years or six years. Or but at the same time, if we want to be called professionals, then what do we do? At the same time, when we exit college and we get jobs that are paid well, we feel that we have made a good investment. And if we exit college and we continue to be paid 20 or $25 an hour, which is not the case for all the students, please don't get me wrong. And even my students at San Diego State sometimes are entering their courses, taking three jobs, and they continue in this economy when, when they graduate with those same three jobs until they find the job that is going to be better for them. So it is not a simple question. I think it can be done, but I think it requires effort on all of the players. The players involved need, the hospitals need to recognize that they cannot give the job to an interpreter who's not professional. But then I will ask the question, what does it mean to be professional? And in this country, it's hard to answer because we have degrees for certain professions that make them a profession, and for others, we don't. And I don't want to leave the conference thinking that interpreting or translation is one thing that can be done without education, because it's not true. We do have examples of wonderful translators and interpreters who have not had an education, but they are not the, they are just outliers, they are exceptions, but we do have successful stories of many, many graduates in programs. Or, so however you can access an education that will let you go and say, this is how I can compete in the market, because I'll be better, I think we can, we can tackle it that way. My, my heart is in education. I don't think we can continue uh, uh, just patching it. I think we need to, to provide that and for people to be able to go through the education, as I said, in many flexible ways so that they can be respected in the field and, and have the be paid what they need, need and deserve to be paid. Thanks to all of you for, for being here and answering our questions. Um, I want to go on with the education issue. Um, Claudia is so passionate about, as I am, I think. <laughs> and that's why I like her work so much. Um, I have a question. My question is, um, a big issue in translator and interpreter training is, is, is having success in that well-rounded education that we, we feel um, compelled to provide, right? Often um, that question has been, um, how to put it, um, organ or, or articulated around the idea that entrance exams to translator and interpreter trainings are the problem or what we should be tackling in terms of literacy, general literacy proficiency and uh, language, foreign language proficiency. I, I guess my question is pretty simple. What do you think of that? Because of course reality often shows that most of us who are translator instructors are just stuck with no entrance requirements. And I don't know if stuck is the question, and I guess that is my question. Great question, great question. Um, stuck. <laughs> I don't know. Um, entry exams, yes and no. Um, first of all, what do ex ex entrance exams measure? That would be my question. Second, what is the population? For example, I work with um, Chinese and Hmong population when I was working on the California Endowment exams for medical interpreting. And had we required a written exam? First of all, I have a problem when we are requiring a written exam for interpreters. And it's not because I'm, I'm here saying interpreters can all be literate. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, let's look at what the reality of the field takes. They need to read but they are necessarily to write. So maybe an essay would not be an adequate measure of an entrance exam. It would tell you that it correlates really highly with other things, but there are languages where we don't have that entrance, for example, that possibility of making an entrance exam. I think that um, we have seen in translation and interpreting courses, interpreters, as well as in language courses, as, as Professor Colina was mentioning before, the heritage speakers, they come in, in different ranges of literacy, right, in terms of possibilities. And we learn how to work with them, and we learn to teach them 
a specific course in academic Spanish and academic English, so we improve their register. So I can imagine, rather than saying no, uh, I can imagine we measure the things that we need correlate the better with the possibility of succeeding in their career, and some of those have already been done for conference interpreting or for translation. I'm not arguing that those are the only ones, or that we could even copy the same ones for healthcare interpreting or for teaching, but I think that when we are talking about teaching and we look at the diversity of the population that could become community interpreters, for example, I would argue that we need to expand the way in which we have thought of entry exams so that we get, for example, in, in the case of healthcare interpreters in the Hmong and Chinese community and even the Spanish, register was a big thing that hasn't been measured before, but if I send an interpreter to a hospital and the patient would say in Spanish, me chopearon la lita, okay? Me chopearon la lita, and, and that patient has, that interpreter has not been exposed to rural Spanish and to using animal body parts to equate to human being body parts because that's how we talk at home, for example, in a rural community where the family went to school up to second grade, for example. We need the knowledge of that utterance too to be able to interpret that. So sometimes um, I run one experiment, so I cannot talk and generalize anything, but um, using uh, nurses as interpreters who have been educated in Sp who have been educated in the U.S. from Spanish textbooks. So in the classroom, they <coughs> learn Spanish in the classroom, and then heritage speakers that would not range in the same register. And, and they were doing equally good, and many times the nurse would not understand what the patient was saying. So it's a tricky one, but we need entry exams. I'm not sure that I would measure accuracy only. Language is necessary. To say that it's a prerequisite for translation and interpreting, I'm not sure, I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying we continue to develop language when we are teaching translation and interpreting. So, because it, it's, it's a fact, we may want to kill each other and say, no, you need to be fully bilingual. First of all, what is fully bilingual, right? Because that's a <laughs> Okay, I think in about, uh, oh. I'm gonna say it, shouldn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm upset with my colleagues, my academic colleagues, particularly in Spain, where I do some work, who criticize the lack of justice around us, who criticize the company that in Spain took over uh, justice interpreting, and then in Britain they made the same mistake on April Fool's Day in 2011. And you sit back, it, it's for us to do something to improve the situation from the training institutions. Going and getting laws done is, is vital work. I mean, it's a question of rights. Get it on the law books and make the context do it. And then it's a question of providing training at the level where it's needed. Strokes for folks. It might be a one-week course or a weekend course or whenever you can get these people in or where you can get out to them. But it's not good enough to sit back and be an armchair activist and lament the lack of justice. It's for us to get out there and do something about it. Alrighty, well, I think uh, we've very clearly belied the local folklore that would have it that this is dead day on campus. <laughs> it's very much alive and kicking day. Um, thank you all for coming. I have a quick favorite.